Let's talk about aliasing. Aliasing is a topic that has come up more and more in discussions of flight controller or firmware and clean, clean flight specifically, uh, as Boris has been working on the gyrosync feature of Betaflight. Now, gyrosync means that for every one reading or sample that the gyro outputs, the PID control loop performs one calculation, and they are exactly in sync with each other. Uh, the gyro is outputting in, in clean flight, or beta flight rather, at one kilohertz, and the control loop is running at one kilohertz. And the, the primary advantage of this, in fact, maybe the only advantage of this, is that it avoids aliasing. Aliasing also comes into play if you're running black box. If you're running black box, black box outputs one reading every control loop. But if your control loop is running fast enough, then black box, the, the, the SD card, you know, the, the serial port can't keep up. And so you can have black box log every other sample, uh, three out of every four samples. You can change the black box rate numerator and black box rate denominator to control how often black box outputs. But if you don't have black box outputting every single sample, aliasing can occur as well. And what got me thinking about doing this video is, uh, I used to have a misconception, and I've seen other people repeat this misconception, that if you're not outputting every sample, then what's the next best fraction, right? What should you be outputting at in black box? And I used to think that one over two was the next best because it's like, you know, instead of slicing something unevenly, like seven eighths, right? What is that? You're slicing it in half, and that seems like that would be the next best thing. Uh, but it turns out that's not true, and that's not the right way to think about it. So let's do a little discussion of aliasing and uh, uh, and what it is and how it works and how, how you can decide you know what frequency you want your black box running at or what's going to be the effect of running at a loop time other than whatever the gyro is outputting at. The first thing to understand when you're thinking about aliasing and any kind of signals analysis really is that any waveform, no matter how complicated, can be deconstructed into a sum of sine waves. So here we've got the bass guitar signal, and it can be deconstructed via a process called a Fourier transform into a series of sine waves at various frequencies. And we can see the peaks here in the spectral output that show the frequency of the sine waves that when added together make this waveform. And the reason that's, well, there's a whole lot of reasons why that's important. Fourier transforms and the concepts behind it make a whole lot of signals analysis possible and are the underlying foundation of a whole lot of really cool things. But from the uh, perspective that we're coming at it in this short video, what you need to understand is that in the, in the examples we're going to look at, we're just going to look at sine waves. And you may think, yeah, well, sure, this is true for a sine wave. But the, the noise coming out of my gyro on my multi-rotor doesn't look anything like a sine wave. It's a complicated wiggly jiggly line. Anything that's true for a sine wave is going to be true for that wiggly jiggly line because that wiggly jiggly line is just a sum of sine waves all put together. Okay, So that's the important thing to know about you know, Fourier analysis. Just any signal, no matter how complex, can be thought of as the sum of a bunch of sine waves. And therefore, anything we can do to sine waves also applies to that signal. All right, moving on. The next concept that I want to introduce is the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. And again, there's a whole lot we could say about that. We could take a whole college course about it, but I'm going to boil it down as simply as possible. Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem answers the question of how much do we need to sample a signal in order to reproduce it? So if we look here, at this graph, we can see that here are two sine waves. And if we were to sample this signal at these intervals where each dot is its own sample, we would get this resulting line. And then if we were to ask the question, what is the frequency of the sine wave that we are sampling? You can see here that we would not have a unique answer. We couldn't answer that question because here is a sine wave at a high frequency and it absolutely matches those points. And here's a sine wave at a lower frequency and it matches those points. And, and we don't know. So we could ask the question, 
what is the minimum sampling rate that we need in order to be able to perfectly reconstruct the sine wave that we're trying to, to sample. And if we look at these examples here, we can see that the minimum frequency we need is two samples per wavelength. And if you don't believe me on that, you can just take my word for it. That's what Nyquist Shannon says, that you need to sample at twice the frequency, or two samples per wavelength, same thing, in order to perfectly reconstruct the sine wave, okay? So, so here, we are sampling at less than the Nyquist uh, frequency, less than two samples per wavelength, and the wave, the, the waveform we're gonna reconstruct is not going to be correct. Here, we are sampling at two samples per wavelength, and the waveform we're gonna reconstruct is gonna be correct, likewise here, and the point of these two examples is that it doesn't matter where in the waveform you happen to pick up the wave. Maybe I could sample and I could line up with the waveform so that I'm catching the top and the bottom of the wave, or maybe I'm catching the middle of the wave. It doesn't really matter. The result's going to be the same. I'm going to get the exact same frequency out. And here we're sampling at higher than the Nyquist frequency, and that's fine too. So you need to sample at twice the frequency in order to perfectly reconstruct the waveform. Whenever you sample at less than twice the frequency, so in other words, if the signal that we're concerned with is 400 hertz, we need to sample at at least 800 hertz in order to reconstruct that signal perfectly. Anything below uh, 800 hertz, we're gonna, we're gonna end up with, with aliasing is what's gonna happen. And now let's talk about aliasing. If we go back to this graphic, we can see that the effect of aliasing or undersampling, whenever we are sampling a signal with frequency components more than twice, more than one half of our sampling rate. So again, to put it into perspective, in beta flight, your sampling rate is one kilohertz because your loop time is 1,000 microseconds. You're sampling at one kilohertz, and therefore anything above 500 hertz is going to be potentially uh, potentially aliased. Okay. So anytime you have frequency components at more than one half your sampling rate or the Nyquist frequency, you're gonna get aliasing. And aliasing will appear as fake ghost signals at a lower frequency. So here we're sampling this high, this high frequency component of the signal, but what's coming out of our algorithm or of our sensor, whatever, is a lower frequency signal. And the formula for, for the actual relationship is that the aliased signal is, is equal to the absolute value of the difference between your sampling rate and the frequency uh, that you're sampling. So for example, here we're sampling at 100 hertz. Therefore, our Nyquist frequency is 50 hertz. Anything below 50 hertz is perfectly reconstructed. Wonderful. We don't need to think about it. Anything above 50 hertz is going to experience aliasing. So here we have a 70 hertz signal. It is 30 hertz away from our sampling frequency, and we're going to have a fake 30 hertz signal in our data that doesn't really exist. And actually, the, the full formula is that the aliasing is the nearest integer multiple of our sampling rate relative to the, uh, the, the signal. So for example, here we've got 160 hertz. The nearest integer multiple of our sampling rate is going to be 200 hertz. So that's a 40 hertz difference. We're going to get 40 hertz aliasing noise. So let's pause for a minute and think about that in the context of clean flight and beta flight. Beta flight samples at one kilohertz, okay? Uh, but let's say you've got a 2000 loop time in clean flight. That means your sampling rate is 500 hertz, and that means that any noise above 250 hertz, that's your Nyquist frequency, if your 500 hertz is your sampling rate, your Nyquist frequency is half of that, or 250 hertz, any noise above 250 hertz is going to experience aliasing. Okay, well, on a mini quad, your, your prop fundamental is usually maybe around 350 or 400 hertz. Okay, so if, you're, if your sampling rate is 500 hertz and your prop fundamental is at 400 hertz, that's a 100 hertz difference, and that means you're going to have phantom noise around 100 hertz. Now, that's not too big of a deal 
because most of the of the signals that you're really concerned with for good flight performance are in the range of about 20 to 50 hertz or below. But anytime your sampling rate would get within about 20 to 50 hertz of a, of a noise peak, you would start to have problems because you would get aliasing noise down in that range of 20 to 50 hertz that you really care about. And so the goal with gyrosync in beta flight and the goal with running your black box at one to one is to avoid creating these phantom signals, these aliasing noise, by sampling. Well, the, the best case is that you sample at the same rate that the data is coming out. Therefore, you do not introduce any additional aliasing. Anytime you reduce the sampling rate, you're potentially introducing aliasing, depending on the frequency uh, uh, that's coming out of the data. It, you know, if you're sampling at, let's say your data has frequencies from 250 hertz to below, and you're sampling, you're getting data sampled at one kilohertz. Okay, so your Nyquist frequency is 500 hertz. Well, if you were to then downsample to 500 hertz, since your data is at 250 hertz or below, you're still above the Nyquist frequency for your data and you're fine. But, but anytime you undersample data, you risk uh, introducing aliasing if you reduce the sampling rate so the Nyquist frequency goes below the, the, the data in the signal that you're sampling. And that's what we're trying to avoid with beta flight and with black box when we do one-to-one -one sampling. Let's talk about black box in a little more detail. Uh, black box, so let's say you're running beta flight, you've got one kilohertz loop time, and you can't keep up with that. What's the next best thing to do? Well, if you set your black box rate denom to two, your sampling rate is now 500 hertz, which means that anytime there's noise near 500 hertz, you're going to end up with aliasing. And we talked about the example of how if your prop fundamental is around 350 to 400 hertz. That's 100 to 150 hertz away from your sampling rate, and that's where your aliasing noise is going to be. Now, that's not too bad. Uh, adding a 100 or 150 hertz noise component, that's not that's not going to show up very much in your, uh, in your black box traces. But it would be better to have a higher sampling rate. So in fact, a sampling rate of 3, 4 is better than a sampling rate of 1 over 2. Because a 3-4 sampling rate is going to give you 750 hertz. And that is going to mean how far away is 750 hertz from your prop fundamental of, say, 400 hertz. Well, now that's 350 hertz away. So now your aliasing noise is going to be up near 350 hertz. And that, well, that's, that's so far away from where you're actually, you're probably not even going to see that. Okay. So uh, the bottom line is that when you're sampling, you want to sample at as high a frequency as possible. It is always better to sample at a higher frequency than a lower frequency because it reduces or eliminates aliasing. And that this idea that a sampling rate of one over two is better than a sampling rate of some weird fraction like seven eighths, that's not true. Seven eighths is better than one half uh, in terms of black box because uh, the seven eighths will have a higher sampling rate. Okay, so the higher sampling rate is always gonna be better because it will, it will reduce the effects of aliasing on your data. One more thing I want to show you before we close out here, and this GIF shows the effect of aliasing on some actual signals. Now this low frequency signal is always going to be sampled at a high enough rate. So we're all, all of these different sampling rates right here, you can see the sampling rate changes. All of these sampling rates are above the Nyquist frequency for this signal, and so it is perfectly reconstructed every time. Likewise, this signal, but this signal, which is at a slightly higher frequency, depending on the sampling rate, you see it more and more effective aliasing. So here is the worst effect of aliasing, and then it gets better as the sampling rate uh, increases. All right, we can see here. And then this one, there's always effective aliasing regardless. Okay, so when the reason I show you this is because when you're looking at your black box data, let's say you're logging black box at one over two. Well, if you see, I wish I could pause this chip, but I can't. No, I don't think I can. If you see something like this, it may be that that's noise in your data, but it may just be that that's aliasing and that noise isn't actually there. And that's why I want to point that out to you. Okay, well, I hope that was helpful as always and happy flying.